My name is Stephanie Tuzlin. I am the education specialist at Willowbrook Wildlife Center, which is um, one of the forest preserves in DuPage County. I've been there for 16 years, so um, a long time. And this is an exciting project for us all. And um, I'm especially excited for it because it's been a long time coming and very much needed. And we're going to talk all about that. But first, we're going to get into um, just the summary of what we're doing at Willowbrook. I'm sure many of you are familiar, but I uh, just Kind of give a little bit of overview with some cute photos. So, okay, so uh, Willowbrook is a native wildlife rehabilitation center. Um, we are one of the oldest in the country. We began in 1956, and we um, are also one of the largest by volume. Uh, there's probably one or two centers in the country that take in more animals than we do, but last year was our busiest year ever with over 11,500 animals brought in. Each year that does seem to increase. Um, and I think that's a combination of the um, number of animals living closer and closer to humans and getting impacted by our development and expansion. Um, it's also a lack of other licensed wildlife rehab in the state. It's not easy work. It's expensive work. Um, so people, um, you know, stop doing it after a while. There are other centers that are wonderful. They um, don't necessarily have the same volume capacity that we do, um, but there's just more animals that are going to need help. Uh, we are owned and operated by the DuPage County Forest Preserve, which is wonderful. Uh, it helps fund our services. We also have the um, all the different forest preserves in DuPage County to release these animals back into. That's the goal of the, the center. Uh, we answered thousands of phone calls ranging from questions about what to do because they found a wild animal that think needs help to how do I keep raccoons out of my attic and so on. Um, so we're a good resource if there's any wildlife concerns for folks. And we, of course, do educational programs. That's where my job comes in, doing um, programs like this. We do a lot of school programming, scout programming, summer camp family programs, and so on. Okay. So uh, we treat orphaned native wildlife. Here's a few examples. Uh, we really do work with just about uh, all species. There are a handful of animals that we don't work with at Willowbrook, mostly due to uh, limitations on our resources. For example, we don't work with white-tailed deer. That's a species we don't have space for, or and deer are very uh, difficult to rehabilitate. They are high-stress animals in captivity, especially an adult. There's really no good way to humanely care for a deer. Um, another bunch of cute selection of orphans. Uh, the summer season, the, you know, spring and summer, really, um, you know, we might have had taken in about 500 animals and by the time April rolls around and then by the end of the summer, right now we're over 7,000. So uh, all those animals came in in just a span of a few months. So the spring and summer is full of babies coming in. Go ahead. Um, we also treat uh, sick or ill native wildlife. Um, the mangy fox or mangy coyote stories are always a great before and after. So kind of shows you um, a fox that came in with terrible mange and uh, a few weeks later, looking very nice in advance. Um, some other illnesses that we work with, unfortunately, some are not curable. Some are very highly contagious um, where we would not treat those animals, um, but there's plenty that we can work with. That hawk on the left is uh, suffering from West Nile virus, um, which is treatable. It, it's not always something they do recover from, but it is a flu essentially. So uh, supportive care fluids are gonna help treat them. Uh, that fo fox snake in the middle is suffering from snake fungal disease, uh, which is something we're seeing now in wild snake populations and she's doing very well. And of course uh, that little finch on the right is um, suffering from conjunctivitis, which I'm sure all the bird feeders are familiar with. Keep a clean feeder and can reduce the spread of that. Take a home. Um, then we also treat injured native wildlife. So um, this is a big bunch of the majority of adults that come in through our doors. Um, the orphans are usually healthy. They've just been orphaned. So the adult animals, you know, if you can catch an adult wild animal, it's probably got something pretty wrong with it. So injuries are um, generally what we see with those adults. Um, we have a beautiful peregrine falcon with an injured wing. Um, 
not an injury necessarily, but definitely a problem for that squirrel in the middle with some trash stuck on his head. We unfortunately see a good amount of entanglements and um, litter issues with our wildlife. And then on the far right is a painted turtle who had a, sh a shell fracture and a jaw fracture. So that little wire under his jaws, uh, keeping it closed up. And he's got a pretty cool um, cast on the bottom of the shell to heal that. You wanna advance? Just some more examples of some animals and cases we might treat. We do not discriminate small species, big species, toads, mice. Um, that toad is getting a, a fractured leg repaired. Um, fox with a cast, a broken leg. Uh, we have gotten several um, oil spill or um, ant geese and ducks that are covered in you know a substance that's not good for them. They have to get baths and stay with us for quite a while to get their feathers back in condition. Uh, a lot of head injury migratory birds, which we're going to, have to talk about more in depth. I know that probably everyone here is familiar with the Chicago Bird Collision Monitors. Um, definitely worth mentioning um, to such a bird-friendly group about them and the work that we do with them. Um, they bring us thousands and thousands of songbirds a year. Uh, of course, during birds' annual fall and spring migration, collisions with windows is a huge risk for them. Uh, downtown Chicago, this wonderful organization, picks up all these birds every morning and throughout the day on busy days. Um, and brings them out to Willowbrook. Any of the birds that have unfortunately passed away do get sent to the Field Museum for research. Any live birds get examined and um, treated with us. Go ahead. I don't know if anyone, I'm sure there's people in um, the club here that have volunteered with CVCM. I used to uh, live in Chicago and volunteer with them. And um, it's such an interesting um, experience to go downtown so early in the morning. Um, and even once the commuters start coming in, you're running around the net and they, no one's paying any attention to you. It's like very interesting to see how oblivious people can be to what's going on around them. And, you know, they don't even notice a bird or someone running around the net um, in the mornings when they're heading to work. Um, this was just the other day, these um, laundry baskets full of the paper bags, which each has a bird inside. Um, we got slammed with migrants last week. It was, we probably had um, over 200 coming in two days. So there's some really busy migration days. So um, those birds come to the center and each one is getting an examination. So a variety of species. Right now it's mostly getting warblers um, and we're seeing um, some thrushes and uh, we'll soon get to some of the other later migrants. Woodcocks are another big one we see in the fall. Um, these birds are given, an, well, they're identified, which is quite challenging at this time of year, as you're well aware, uh, fall warblers and their non-breeding plumage are going to be difficult, and then you get the juveniles as well. Um, we work hard to um, age and sex these birds if possible, um, so it's a good challenge for our keeper staff, and uh, birds that are healthy and flying well and have no injuries are released pretty quickly. Uh, we do ban the birds before the release so you can see um, they're measuring that little sparrow's leg uh, to see what band size he'd wear. Um, those bands would help with research um, if these birds are ever recovered or found again in a mist net that that number is gonna tell scientists when that bird was banded, the age, the sex, and all that. There's some really interesting information that scientists have got out of birds that they've recaptured in mist nets even year after year um, in the same exact spots um, that this banding is is going to tell us. Go ahead. Um, and of course, the best part of the whole process of, of working at Willowbrook is the releasing of these wild animals. There's some, some examples of some of the CDCM birds getting released. Um, we do like to involve the public when possible because it's pretty cool to be able to watch birds get released. It's unpredictable, unplanned releases, but if we have folks on site, we um, try to include them in watching this really cool um, process. And um, like I said, this time of year, we are just trying to empty out our rehab areas and get all the animals out that can get out. Um, so it's all about the release. Uh, that's the main goal at Willowbrook. And of course, uh, another big, really important part of our mission is education. Um, we provide a lot of different types of programs. We'll do hundreds a year. Um, people coming to Willowbrook to, to 
see our animals that are on exhibit. Um, we have very successful summer camps where the uh, campers are able to help us take care of the animals. They learn all about what it takes to be a, a animal keeper. That includes preparing diets, feeding the animals, which of course is fun. Um, and then uh, a lot of other fun programs that we do with a different variety of groups. Okay, so just to give you some idea of uh, last year, these are some statistics. So you can see birds did make up the majority of the species we took in. The numbers are a little small, kind of hard to read, but uh, that's over 7,000 birds we cared for, over 4,000 mammals, and then uh, amphibians and reptiles are represented, not very large numbers of those guys. And one insect, which I looked up because I was very curious <laughs> about the one insect, I said, needed to know his story. It was a dragonfly that uh, was actually rescued by the Chicago Bird Collision Monitors. He may have mistakenly come our way within with the birds because sometimes those dragonflies actually get um, trapped downtown. They don't, they're just confused and stunned and they get brought out to a safer, more natural area as well. So I'm guessing he was a stowaway, um, but he was released. So that's good. Um, and you can see how many phone calls we took in last year, over 16,000. That's a lot. Um, very great dedicated phone staff. Um, just for some fun bird trivia, I uh, pulled up the top 11, I don't know why not 10, but top 11 species of birds that we took in last year. So you can kind of see some numbers. Um, mallards are top of the list there. And that's usually the bulk of that 957 are ducklings. Uh, same with the geese, a big chunk of that 455 geese that we treated for goslings. Um, robins, a lot of those were young birds too. Uh, the interesting thing is when we get to the brown creepers, white-throated sparrow, Tennessee warblers, um, oven birds, those are all through migration. So we get those birds in huge numbers. Um, the ring-billed gulls are kind of a weird one in this list. That was because if you all remember last summer, the gulls were um, jumping or falling or being pushed off the roof nesting uh, site that they use. Um, the young birds were on the ground. It was very hot. Um, this happened two summers in a row. So we had a big jump in ring-billed gulls, uh, which was interesting um, and not expected and not usual really. But uh, unfortunately their nest area was not good in really high heat. Okay. So we're gonna switch gears here and talk more about that master plan that we came here to hear about. Um, I've been asked a few times how it's going <laughs> and the answer is it hasn't started officially. <laughs> um, just like most construction projects, we are a bit delayed in our start, but it is um, getting there, you know, much closer here. So this week is kind of the official starting um, for the uh, project. Uh, th this project actually began probably 10 plus years ago, uh, we had a master plan and part of it was completed and that's our parking lot. Um, the, the expansion of the parking lot, the permeable paver lot and our support building we call it, which is um, being used as office space and a bird uh, nursery building. It's really not supposed to be permanent office space. It's supposed to be uh, endangered species recovery building, which you will eventually get to fulfill that destiny uh, once we get these following phases going. So there was a big break in the timeline of this project, um, which was great though, because it did allow us to reevaluate the plans. We've completely changed. Um, you know, we went through the whole design process many years back, but we've totally changed what we want it to look like with um, some new leadership and with the changing needs of the center and with the changing um, rehabilitation world and advances in knowledge and medical updates. So um, we've gotten a chance to really design the center to reflect our needs now. So as you can see the parking lot and that's um, species recovery um, building is highlighted that was in master plan phase one. So that's been completed for like I said, many, many years now, 2011. Um, well, it was completed in 2015, I should say, but it uh, began in 2011. So the next stage, it's, it's kind of weird to say we're starting phase two because it feels like we're starting all over again. Um, so phase two will begin this fall and uh, that's gonna cover the rest of um, the area outside of what's already been done. Uh, we've been developing this for the last year and um, really getting into um, 
more of that planning stage and construction will be, like I said, beginning in the next couple of weeks here. Go ahead. Um, so our purpose at Willowbrook is to be a native wildlife rehabilitation facility that provides care and medical treatment to injured, orphan, and injured and orphan wild animals, also serves as a resource to teach DuPage residents about living in harmony with local wildlife. So our vision is a little different. Um, we are a state-of-the-art wildlife rehabilitation facility that is a national leader in engaging visitors in veterinary science, medical care, and wildlife rehabilitation, while champion healthy, interconnected ecosystems to foster safe, healthy, and sustainable communities for all living things in DuPage County and beyond. So that was something that we um, kind of re-envisioned when we had that chance uh, in 2020 to really determine the future of Willowbrook. So it's a newer vision that we've worked on. Okay, so the goals of this new program, um, we are transitioning away from having a collection of non-releasable animals on exhibit and switching our focus to wildlife rehabilitation and reintroduction back into the wild. Um, we wanna improve our animal safety, welfare and conditions for the rehabilitation and restoration of them. Uh, we want to improve our facility safety and efficiencies. There's many, many ways that can be done for our staff and volunteers. Uh, we want to engage and immerse the public into the re wildlife rehabilitation process. Um, and uh, it's some pretty cool stuff planned for people to, be able to see what's really going on at the center. Um, we want to support propagation of at-risk species that will advance wildlife medicine and rehabilitation. Um, there's a lot in the field that's changed in the last several years. And so um, as you know, Willowbrook, if anyone's familiar with the National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association, Willowbrook was one of the original um, organizations that started that group. Um, it got rehabbers from all over the country together to share notes and learn from each other. And um, that's something that's uh, really important in wildlife rehabilitation because there's not necessarily uh, a guide how to do it. I mean, now there is, but there wasn't in those days. So sharing this um, information with each other was hugely important and um, impactful for rehabbers across the country. So um, we have sort of, you know, in the last, you know, two couple of decades, pulled back a little bit from our involvement in some of these national organizations. And um, currently we're trying to get back in in on that and trying to um, become leaders and go to uh, rehabbers in the fields. Um, we also want to be more sustainable and energy efficient. We use a lot of energy at Willowbrook and we would like to offset that. Um, so, you know, when we look at rehabilitation today, it, it has changed a lot. If you look at animal care, if you look at um, you know, animals living in managed care or captivity, a lot of attitudes have changed about that. So there, there are things that we need to respond to. Um, there are things that we need to recognize with how our animals are cared for and kept. So those are um, some of the driving influences for our plan. Um, there's definitely been advances in wildlife medicine and we are outdated. And it's like I was mentioning, there, we have declined in local, national, international presence. We'd like to change that. Okay, so there's a lot of pictures here. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but this is kind of showing the why for some of the changes we're making, um, how our existing facility does not um, appropriately help us do our work um, and actually can impede our, our uh, work. Um, so it's just a lot of very crowded areas. Um, we had a very horrible several weeks over the summer where we have two sets of industrial washers and dryers and uh, one washer broke in one building and the dryer broke in another building. And it was a horrible several weeks of that picture, um, this laundry breezeway of that for weeks. And we could not keep up with that laundry. And um, it was not fun uh, and it was not practical. <laughs> we need to be able to use towels and we use them for everything. And, um, you know, being reliant on outdated equipment and uh, machinery is, is an issue. 
Um, we have housing uh, issues where we have more animals than we can safely and humanely house. Um, you see that picture on the, on the right, the ICU, there's animals being housed in carriers. It's definitely not what we'd like to do. They shouldn't, they should be in appropriate um, enclosures instead of carriers, but we sometimes have periods of time where we are overcrowded. Go ahead. Um, so just some more images of some of the workspaces. Um, we get overwhelmed with patients and uh, we just do not have the facilities to uh, it, it currently uh, properly house them and efficiently care for them. Um, you know, as many of you know, Willowbrook has been closed to the public. We have a visitor center that, you know, for historically have been open. There's uh, some of the non-releasable songbirds and reptiles in there. Um, but when COVID started, we really knew that, well, first of all, the center had to close um, and we wanted to spread our staff out. Our volunteers couldn't come in. So our staff was um, doing all hands on deck animal care. And we wanted to spread ourselves out, stay safe. And we started overflowing into the uh, exhibit spaces. Um, you know, the classroom that I would normally ha have teaching in is full of baby bunnies. And our exhibit room with the songbirds is full of opossums. And um, the lobby is full of baby birds. So, you know, we were spreading out um, and it was really effective. We were able to separate these species and really focus on their care and include, improve their husbandry. But we also, um, it, be it became a necessity um, if we want to continue to care for as many animals as we do. Um, if we had to pull back to reopen, I would greatly impact the number of species we can care for and how we get well we can care for them. So that was the decision was made to stay closed, focus on the, the rehabilitation efforts. And that's a big part of our mission moving ahead. Okay. Um, another concern, you know, is the type, you know, we've got aging infrastructure, aging enclosures, um, enclosures that are really difficult to provide proper um, environmental conditions for our animals. We have several species that live on our trail system that are migratory birds or um, birds that have medical conditions that do not, uh, it's not good for them to be out in the winter, but we don't have um, designated indoor space for them. So we have to do, uh, just make uh, enclosures every year somewhere that's not really supposed to be an enclosure for, you know, a kestrel with arthritis or um, a great horned owl that is, you know, aging and having some issues. So uh, the current setup isn't really developed properly for all phases of these animals' lives, especially these animals that have medical conditions. So um, we are changing their exhibits um, to reflect those needs. Um, these are just some of the best practices for housing wildlife, where you wanna include better predator controls, um, space needs, um, environmental protection and acclimation, um, species appropriate materials, you know, uh, wire cages we think of as a bird cage, but they're actually very damaging to birds' feathers. So not really appropriate to use that type of material. Uh, a double gated entrance. Um, I, I was happy when I walked into your meeting and I saw a portrait of one of my favorite birds at Willowbrook, Scarlet, the red-shouldered hawk. And uh, I had a conversation about this, the time she escaped, uh, which, Thankfully, we got her back, so it was a happy ending, but that wouldn't have happened if she had a double door system. So um, <laughs> that is something that's really important for birds to have that you're going in and out. They can't get out. Um, so that's something that, you know, should be included on any future um, animal enclosures. Okay, so the main components are, um, you know, the existing buildings are in gray there. So the rest of those are gonna be new. The, the white building is um, the new cl clinic and visitor center and all those green um, rectangles are going to be enclosures, new rehab enclosures, expanding the outdoor spaces that we need so desperately. Go ahead. Um, we are also very excited that we are including a lot of sustainable features including bird-friendly glass. That was very important to us that we didn't create our own patients because there is gonna be a lot of glass on this building. Um, geothermal energy, which is very exciting. Solar panels, which we do already have covering one of our buildings, but we will be including more. Um, native landscaping, dark sky lighting, um, using sustainable materials on the actual you know, build. Go ahead. 
Okay, so the schedule, which as I mentioned, we're a little behind here, but we are still, you know, starting our work in 2022. Uh, this fall, they'll begin starting to build some of those outdoor enclosures. They need to be built first because that is where our trail animals will be moving. So they will be moving into the enclosures that are the first thing to be built. Um, this will also include a lot of our uh, rehab, new rehab enclosures, which is again, desperately needed. Um, once those resident animals move into their new homes, then work can continue on the rest of the site. Um, so 2023, we will um, have the new visitor center building constructed. The idea is that our current facility will keep operating as is while the new building is, is being built. So it will not impact um, being able to take patients and do rehabilitation. It's really important for us to stay open throughout this process. It might look a little different how that process goes. We may have to set up a temporary admissions center or something, but we'll figure that out as we get there. Go ahead. Um, so 2024 uh, will bring the completion of the visitor center and the clinic and um, start to demolish some of the uh, old, no longer necessary building and enclosures that will be replaced. Um, eventually, 2025, kind of the last stages of this project would be to convert our current office space intended to be endangered species recovery space into that purpose. Um, there are a lot of Forest Preserve District conservation programs that uh, we would be able to support with that building. So that's pretty exciting. And eventually the grand opening. Um, just another kind of overhead of the look of the, the new center. Um, very small words. So, um, you know, those, if you want to watch back and, um, you know, get out some reading glasses, to, to, it's hard to see what that says, but uh, identifying the individual buildings here. Um, but there are a lot of solar panels listed on here. Um, you know, you can see some of the features of our current site, the hexagon or octagon um, raptor flight facility now looks pretty small in comparison to some of the new raptor enclosures and flight spaces that we're going to be building. That's just very exciting. Okay, you can go ahead. Um, so a kind of a uh, rendering of what the facility will look like from the outside. So as I said, a lot of glass, but um, the company we're working with is very committed to our concerns about um, bird danger and has developed a design that will be, um, you know, built into the glass to that birds can see. Um, there was also going to be some pretty good um, cool looking screening outside some of the windows that would be decorative and functional as a um, bird barrier. Go ahead. Just more views. Keep going. Um, so what I'm very excited about is a new classroom that won't be full of bunnies that I can teach in again. Um, and with the ability to have outdoor space to teach as well. Um, so the there's a whole new visitor center and a new classroom that's gonna be um, much larger capacity than we currently have. and um, all the updates we need. Go ahead. Another view. We wanted it to kind of, you know, blend into the landscape a bit more. Um, so these are the features that we wanted that are currently included in the project scope that are the sustainable features. Um, the, the clinic and visitor center, the um, plan is that it is a net zero building, which would be the first of its kind in DuPage County. So that is very exciting, um, which means we will produce as much energy as we consume. Um, and for us, like I mentioned, we do use a lot, a lot of electricity, a lot of water. Um, so this is exciting. Uh, the, there's been, okay, I, guess, I guess I shouldn't say there hasn't been work that started. There is drilling that's been going on for the geothermal um, energy. So big, big uh, drilling equipment we had to go very, very deep in the ground it has already begun. Um, but it's very important to us that these are all included as much as possible. Okay, so again, very small writing, but just to give you an overview of the layout of the new clinic, um, all that yellow space is public space. So uh, a new exhibit area and a, the classroom, front desk space. Um, but what's really exciting about that is the 
um, exhibit room, exhibit area, uh, has one-way glass into the rehab sections. So people visiting will be able to watch animals get examined when they come in. They'll be able to watch procedures. Uh, there will be windows and um, monitors into our surgery areas. Um, so if you like watching surgery or interested, uh, you can watch a surgery happen, uh, which we do a lot of surgeries, so that's pretty cool. Um, there'll be windows into some of the animal care rooms. Um, we have a window into some of the raptor spaces, as well as opossums and raccoons, some fun species to watch. I mean, those are uh, the designated areas, but th that may change uh, based on our patient needs and who uh, people might like to see in those windows. Um, but one of the greatest things about this setup is um, every kind of species group has its place. So there is a section for waterfowl. There's a section for rodents. We get a lot of squirrels. Uh, there's a whole section for cottontails. There's a whole section for carnivores. It's really important to us to keep the predator and the prey separate. Currently, they sometimes can see each other and that's not ideal. Um, it stresses both of them out, the prey because they're feeling washed and scared, the predators because they can't get to the prey they might want to. So um, best practice would be to keep them separate, keep the sight lines down. Um, so each kind of little suite of areas has a common space with um, you know, water, sink, preparation areas, um, but then there's not going to be this overlapping of everything as it is now. Um, you know, currently we have one common kitchen for everything, so we'd be able to kind of stock these individual areas um, as needed. There are going to be larger um, cleanup areas for doing dishes, um, doing some laundry, and then a lot of more storage, which of course, who doesn't need more storage? So all very exciting. Um, and my, again, my most excited um, feature here is that new classroom, um, which is going to be lovely. So I continue. Not as exciting for people outside of the staff, but a second floor where we have um, office space, actually enough office space, so people can have their own desks. We currently share a lot of times. Um, and our reptiles that are currently on exhibit will be sharing the space with us, um, which for the, the rest of their lives, which is fun to have, a, have an office snake. Go ahead. Um, this is an early image. We're still working on the development of the exhibits, but um, the idea is, again, to highlight the rehabilitation work. That's really the interesting and important thing about what we're doing at Willowbrook. So windows um, into those areas with um, interpretive signage, artifacts uh, to share and explain the process that we're going through. Uh, a lot of um, other on the opposite side, we're going to have some panels um, again with signage and themed appropriately to, again, share all information about native wildlife, coexisting, um, our impacts, how we can change that, um, eco-friendly living, and the uh, sustainable features that are included in that building, how you can do that type of thing at home. We are want to include um, uh, some large monitors too, where we'll be able to set up like webcam type things in uh, other areas. So you can see animals, what they're doing while they're there with us. So people always wanna see what they're up to. Sometimes it's boring and a lot of sleeping and other times it's really interesting. Um, just a rendering of the, of the classroom space, which is lovely. Go ahead. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a lot of ways you can help support. The DuPage County Forest Preserves, we have a friends group. They do wonderful things for us. There's a night for nature coming up. Uh, next week, which is a fundraiser. And this will wrap us up here. And I'm happy to take some questions. Very excited about this project. And, um, you know, something I've been waiting a long time to see, not only, um, I don't know, none of us, you know, we really have believed this will happen until uh, the things are, you know, machines are digging into the ground. So uh, still waiting on those big moments, but they seem to be approaching very rapidly here. Okay, so it's a great question. The question was, what will we animals that cannot be released 
um, or not suitable for exhibit. So uh, the thing with exhibit, exhibit wildlife, basset or wildlife species, um, we have made a choice, per, you know, at Willowbrook that we don't want to continue having that. We've noticed over the last several years um, that these animals are living with increased stress. They're living with hard to manage pain. Um, these are wildlife animals and adjusting to life around humans is not easy. Um, I'm not, not to say that all, uh, there's not some wildlife that would adjust well. And we do have some of those examples too. Um, but I would say that on average, maybe 10% of the animals that are non-releasable might make good candidates to live in a, a permanent facility. Um, most of the injuries our current residents have um, like I said, are painful. They've developed arthritis. Um, they've developed, um, you know, stress behaviors, responses that um, definitely tell us they're not comfortable. And so knowing what we know now, we would not consider those good candidates for placement. So uh, a lot of the animals that are non-releasable, if, um, if they would not make a good candidate for a placement somewhere, they are humanely euthanized. Um, you know, I was, we were just talking about, uh, you know, numbers, real numbers of animals we take, numbers of animals released. And um, overall, Willowbrook tends to have good release rates. Um, if we look at patients that we are caring for, um, the release rates after 24 hours of, of admissions is usually about 70%, which is very good for a wildlife rehabilitation center. Um, the first 24 hours are critical. A lot of animals pass away on their own. Uh, a lot of animals are determined to require humane euthanasia. Some don't make it even to our doors. Some die while they're waiting to be examined. Um, so out of the ones that make it past that first critical period, about 70% are released, which is, which is good. Um, I mean, it is a reality of, of wildlife rehabilitation that euthanasia is a treatment option. It's, not, it's definitely not one we go to first, but it's uh, important that we use that uh, when necessary to, you know, not only is our goal to release animals, but it's also to relieve suffering and not have animals um, with, you know, unnecessary pain or stress. Um, and since we won't be exhibiting wildlife, you know, if there are those particular candidates that might make great ambassadors somewhere else, um, we would work to potentially locate a home where we know they would be getting excellent care. Yes. Okay. Sure. So for 11,500 animals, how many veterinarians do we think would be a good number? Um, I will say for the first time in Willowbrook's history, we have two veterinarians on the staff. Um, we had one forever. And in the last uh, two years, we finally got a second. Um, and we uh, probably five years ago got our first uh, full-time vet tech on staff. So uh, prior to that, it was one vet and a lot of uh, volunteers, um, volunteer vets, volunteer cl clinic staff, volunteer techs. Um, we do a lot of volunteers and we need our volunteers. Our staff numbers are 19 folks total. Um, we about doubled that in the summer season with seasonal help, and, you know, um, but it's not a, definitely a... a doesn't feel like enough people to take care of all these animals. Um, and that is, you know, part of the issue is, you know, the inefficiencies of our current center make things that much harder. So having these um, separate areas designed are gonna make things a lot easier. And we would love to increase the staff we have. It, it, it definitely would help out a lot. Um, but we do have a very large volunteer base um, very essential. Uh, we have over 100 year-round volunteers, and we get a lot of interns also in the summer season. So that's really helpful. Yes. Um, yeah, this has been very interesting. Uh, and the presentation. Uh, I have a question about funding. Mm -hmm. I understand this is part of the work that you're supposed to do. for the answers of friends looking for her. And we do. And so Willowbrook's a little different. We are part of the forest preserves and we um, 
do get a lot of donations. Uh, Willowbrook receives a huge amount of donations, which is wonderful. Um, and we're kind of a, a little bit of a separate funding because of the animals that we care for. It's a little bit different. Um, but the majority of the money coming from this is, is through the forest preserve through um, a bond. Um, we did have a, a nice um, amount of money that was large donations, private donations that was set aside for this project. And we are uh, seeking out some grants to help support some of the, um, the um, that zero uh, features as well. Yeah, so the friends um, do, our, we don't have a Willowbrook specific fundraiser anymore. That might be what you were referring to. Um, the friends found uh, of the Forest Preserve Group have kind of taken over all those efforts. And the Forest Preserve, or the fundraiser they do annually now, it's, it's called a Night for Nature. All that money goes to the Forest Preserve and uh, it identified which projects are going to be kind of featured. Um, and, you know, folks that want to make donations, um, you can direct where you'd like monies to go. Mm -hmm. Yes. Not all of them. So the trail enclosures are going to be coming down. Um, so the, if you know the trail that you you know, are used to walking along, seeing those, those are coming down. Um, a lot of the outdoor rehab enclosures are staying um, as is, and then new ones will be added as well. Um, so we've actually done a few improvements in the last few years. Um, we got replaced all the fencing in one of our large um, block of enclosures outdoors, which is a huge improvement. So a lot of that is staying. It's um, sound. It, it works well enough, um, but we're getting some new ones. But yeah, that, that tr existing trail is completely going to be changed. Is, the visitor center, so if you're familiar with Willowbrook, you know, there's the current main building, the trail, and then the picnic shelters kind of to the right, if you're facing. Um, in between where the current visitor center is and picnic shelter will be the new building, which is kind of right where our trail is. That's why those animals <laughs> need new enclosures built before anything else can happen. Um, their new enclosures will be really nice. They will have indoor access, heating elements, um, because again, uh, this, these are aging birds and mammals. They're mostly a geriatric population. Um, pretty much all the birds with a couple exceptions are on medication for arthritis and other painful conditions. So we're going to give them a really nice retirement home. Um, the good news about that, though, is those enclosures will then, as these residents pass away, those enclosures will be used for rehab. So they are not, you know, built specifically only for that purpose. They will be transitional into rehab housing, which will always be necessary. You know, we're committed to letting these guys live the rest of their lives out with us, um, but we want to give them something nice or something uh, more appropriate so they can be comfortable. Yes, we are. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. So we do get a lot of questions and I'll address this because it's, it's definitely worth bringing up. Um, everyone has something they don't wish we re rehabilitated. Why do you rehabilitate raccoons? Why chipmunks? Why squirrels? Why geese? Um, those are the big ones. Um, and to be honest, they all are native species. They're all protected. Well, they're not all protected. Chipmunks are protected, but um, they're, you know, all important in our local ecosystems. Um, the other thing too is we get so many squirrels and so many geese and so many raccoons. Um, it gives our, our staff, our veterinarians, an opportunity to um, really get good at what they're doing, get a lot of experience doing um, fracture repairs on a goose. And then that's gonna translate into uh, a high level of confidence um, to repair a fractured eagle wing. You know, So um, the more these patients that these species we think of as common or nuisance pot potential um, do have their value in letting us uh, get experience. Um, as I mentioned, most of the animals that come in are coming in because of human impacts. So it's kind of, um, you know, important that we work to correct some of those if we can. 
Yes. Yes. So uh, if we are unable to help an animal based on our, um, you know, resources that we have available, uh, we do have sometimes capacities of things we can take, or um, certain species or ages are just more than we might be able to work with. You know, since we are so high volume um, and we aren't there 24 hours a day, uh, we don't have success with some of the tiniest newborn baby birds or baby mammals. Um, those types of animals that require much more around the clock care often do better in private rehabilitators hands because they keep them at home with them. They're able to give them that around the clock care. Um, Fawns, uh, our species, we don't take deer. There are other centers that do. Uh, a lot of times they don't need intervention though. So we try to help people figure out when. We um, often, like we take in a lot of peregrine falcons that are uh, juveniles and we raise them up to a certain point, but we currently don't have enough flight, large flight space. We will, they hope in this new building, which is great, but currently don't have that. Um, so we usually send them to another center we just sent um, uh, several to the Illinois Rapper Center for to finish off their flight conditioning, um, and then they'll be released from there. Um, just today, I was giving a tour, and we have I don't know about a dozen or so, maybe more raptors in our flight loop. That's a lot. That's a crowded space. We can't just you know keep adding more and more. So our space is pretty full <laughs> as is. Um, so that's where we might send some of these animals elsewhere. Um, usually young coyotes, if we get any, we um, often work with some other rehabbers that maybe I might be in more um, rural areas that they can get them somewhere out of the um, highly developed suburbs. And one more. How did Amy and Julia decide to get here? I mean, it was pretty random in the spring. Yes, um, so avian flu. Thankfully, we didn't have any outbreaks at Willowbrook. Uh, we did have patients come in that were suspected to have avian flu. Um, any patients that were a high risk species, which were waterfowl and raptors, um, primarily, they weren't, they're not the only ones that could get it, but they're the most high risk. If they had certain symptoms, they would be euthanized um, before potentially exposing them to the rest of our population. Um, or if unsure, quarantined for a period of time, if again, if they're high risk species. Um, we uh, started um, a lot more PPE amongst the staff. Um, so staff going in to work with raptors or waterfowl, gloves, masks, shoe covers. Um, if you're handling them, you'd wear, you know, a uh, suit, hazmat, not a hand, essentially a hazmat suit. Um, you know what I'm trying to say? Um, we would use foot baths uh, to after exiting spaces with those animals so we're not transporting things around in our shoes. Um, so we were lucky that we didn't have an outbreak. We were also lucky none of our, our, our resident animals were affected. We worked really hard to keep everything separate um, and, and not risk cross-contamination. It's definitely a concern. And it still is something that we're, they're finding birds that are, are still um, positive, uh, but it's not the big numbers like it was, thankfully. I do think there were a lot more probably cases than were actually tested in Illinois. Uh, You're welcome. welcome. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. And, uh, and I also very much appreciate all of the work you put into that slideshow. You had lots and lots of interesting information in there. So by our planning team and I got to steal some of this, but right. I, uh, it was fun for me to work on Great, well, thanks again. Um, now I have managed to escape doing this presentation the last two or three meetings, uh, probably because the person that uh, was in charge of the meetings didn't do a good job of time management, but I am gonna do this presentation now. And it is related to using eBird when you travel. And I, I'm always surprised at the, the number of people who do not use eBird uh, for, for their own reasons. They have different ways of tracking birds, but here's an example of why you might wanna become an eBird member, even if you don't use it to track your, your, uh, your sightings. When you travel, it has a wonderful set of resources that you can 
take advantage of. And I'm gonna kind of rely on a trip that five of us took down south of Tucson this past April uh, as some examples as we go through this. So, Steve. All right, so we're gonna get started in this process. If you're traveling in the United States, you need to know the county of where you're gonna be going, which is pretty easy to find. If you're going to a foreign country, you need the state of the province uh, that you're gonna be going to. And the second thing you would need would be an eBird account question. Some of the things that I will talk to you about it is necessary to have an account because they will automatically email you information. If you don't want that, you don't have to become a member. The rest of the information that I will share with you, uh, you do not need to be a member. It's just research that you can do on their website. So with that, let's go on to ebird.org, where you would sign up for eBird if you aren't. And we're going to be using the Explore menu. You can see that up in the top, uh, top left of the screen. And go ahead, Steve. And so, one of the, go ahead and hit it again, Steve. Towards the bottom of that last screen, there was this section here species you need and alerts. Now, I'm going to focus on the right side. <clears throat> Uh, about alerts. And if you're an eBird member currently, you get alerts about rare birds that are seen in Cook County, DuPage County. Well, you can set up the same thing for your trip to Tucson or wherever you're going to be going. You get those alerts to head of you know what's being seen out there. I'm going to just take a second and point out on the left side of this, their target species. And this is more for when you get there. I'm speaking more generally right now about planning to go. But when you get there, close to you, you might want to hit that and you can say, well, I want to get an alert every time someone sees a Carolina group. And so while you're there, all of a sudden up comes a report just for that particular type of bird and you'll know where it's from here in your vicinity. But we're going to continue on with the list so you um, uh, can see that process. Go ahead, Steve. Oh, nice circle the work going. All right, so you hit it again. Okay. So here we have two types of alerts that you can sign up for. And so I signed up for the rare bird alerts and the county of Santa Cruz. That's where we were traveling. And then I also got a needs alert anytime a bird that I had not seen before, I would get a needs alert. So you get an email automatically to you from the county anytime a rare bird has been spotted there, or if a bird that you have seen before, not on your e bird list. A period. So you can get sign up anytime you want ahead of time. And then receiving these alerts to get an idea of what birds you're visiting where in the county that you're going to be traveling to. Go ahead. Uh, and you can read this in your an eye. But the, it, it is basically a summary of the daily needs alert that you might get. In this case, it was an American bittern, a peregrine falcon, and a vesper sparrow were found here in the DuPage area. Uh, but that's the type of thing that you would get on a regular basis with these needs alerts. Okay, Steve. So we're going back to the Explore menu, talk about another feature that you can uh, look into. And this is down in the oh, I, down in the right hand corner. Uh, the alerts go ahead. And I already talked about the target species, what that, that does. So let's go up to the explore regions. So go ahead. And one more 
to show you my fancy little circle there. All right, and so in this case, we're going to explore the county that we are going to be visiting. We knew we were going to Santa Cruz in Arizona. If you type that in and hit return, go ahead. And so now up pops a screen, talks about Santa Cruz. Go ahead, Steve. And you can see 456 different species have been identified there. And 134 hot spots to choose from. Go ahead. So when you hit that hot spots, Hard to see, but it gives you a list of the top hot spots in Santa Cruz County. And you can see Patagonia Lake State Park, number one, Patagonia Lake State Park, the birding trail, number two. Go ahead. So the, the first one was kind of general, state parks, big, big area. But uh, if you want to see what's been going on in the Patagonia Lake State Park, the birding trail, when you click on that, now it shows you in order of the sightings what has been seen there, showing you mallard and Mexican duck and Piedville grieve and so on and so on. Go ahead. So one of the things that I like, I don't know if many people use this, is this illustrated checklist for the county. And you can see here on the right side are pictures of the species that have been seen in Santa Cruz County. And on the left side is a type of bar chart that shows the frequency in which they are seen. Go ahead. So let's say that we wanted to see a barrel line hummingbird while we were there. Now, the bar chart shows when it has been seen there in the past. We were going in April. And so if you look at it, there's very little chance that we would have found a barrel line hummingbird, and indeed we did not, in April. But if there are birds in that illustrated checklist that you're interested in, see if you have any chance of seeing them before you break your back trying to go out and find them. Go ahead. Now there's more that you can learn from this. Let's say from this, uh, the Patagonia uh, birding trail, again, it lists all the sightings. Let's say you say, well, the broad-billed hummingbird is a bird that I'd like to, to know a little bit more about. Never seen one of those. Click on that and up comes all the information about that species. Shows you several different pictures of the broad-billed hummingbird gives you information about what it sounds it might make and lots of more information about each of the species there. So you can kind of prep yourself ahead of time. You know what you're gonna see, investigate a little bit more. So you're prepared to see it, find it when you get there. So let's go to uh, our finding a species. And this is, um, something that we were interested in when we got ready to go out there we wanted a couple birds that we really wanted to see go ahead see so we're going to go to that species map portion and hit the and you can see that in this case we were interested in a red-faced warbler so we wanted to find out if there were any red-faced warblers around where we were going Go ahead, Steve. Now, here's the exception to the rule. Before you had to know the county you were going. For some reason now they say, tell us the area that you're gonna be going to. Well, if you're familiar enough with the county and you've done your research, you have an idea of some of the areas and, and maybe you've seen from some of the checklists that, hey, maybe Ramsey's Canyon is a good place to look for that. Uh, red-faced warbler, go ahead. And uh, we just set it to the current year. We don't wanna know what happened 10 years ago. We wanna know what's happening now in terms of sightings, go ahead. And so when we filled in the data, up came all these sightings of red-faced warblers. And Ramsey Canyon is the area down to the lower right-hand side. Go 
diaphragm. And if you go to any one of those points, it'll bring up the latest observations for that particular area. So here's the Ramsey Canyon. And it showed us that uh, just a couple of days around, uh, we were, well, actually I did this after we came back to this particular screen, but uh, we saw that there were four of them spotted there uh, on the 2nd of May, another guy found one of them, uh, somebody else found one. And so it's giving us a pretty good idea that, boy, there's a good chance of finding our target there in Ramsey Canyon. So we went to Ramsey Canyon, we got the red-faced warbler, and if you use the eBird like this in the Explore member uh, portion, you will find your bird too. So thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, we went to a, the question was did we go to Sierra Vista? Uh, and I don't believe we went to that specific spot, but uh, we kind of by using eBird found the places that had the birds that we were most interested in. So we did our research ahead of time. And you can read books, and we had books on you know where to see birds in, in Arizona. This was almost real time that we were able to go in there and okay, we want to see the red-faced uh, warbler, we want to see the Mexican duck. Where do we go to see that? So we were how many species of hummingbirds did we see when we were there? We saw probably eight eight different species of hummingbirds. Diane? It's, it's, it's not a hot spot, it's just sort of like a, an area name. You know, you know how um, hot spots, there'll be several hot spots around the same area. And so it's that kind of an idea where you kind of know the the area in general, you name the area, and then it'll pop up all those little red pointers for every sighting around it. Yeah, exactly. So county name is too broad. It won't take a county name, unfortunately. You have to be, take your pardon? I didn't try that, uh, but probably. I guess, but it might be too broad. I mean, they need to get 6,000 little red yeah. arrows there. You can you can play within the map. You can zoom in on it. Uh, so you can, yeah, you can, you can zoom in on the map so you don't see as many of those little red pointers. Yeah. 